Amazon, parts of the Amazon where it's been deforested. We not only have to provide energy for ourselves, we've got to learn to provide commercial energy for the poorest in the world. Two sources, two possible sources. We've got PV, solar. We've also got biogas from waste. 10% of the world's energy could come from using waste if we used it properly. So there's enormous potential for rural areas in the developing world to get their energy that way. Can we achieve this two degree target? That presents to you the problem. Those are the emissions of, regular, of uh, carbon dioxide on the left in gigatons per year, billions of tons a year. They amount to about 30 gigatons a year at the moment from the whole world. If we're going to have any chance at all of reaching a two degree target in Copenhagen, we will have a 50% chance if we followed that green, green curve. Only a 50% chance, but that's better than nothing. We have to peak the emissions of the globe by 2015 or thereabouts. We've got to peak well before 2020, otherwise we can't conceivably achieve the two degrees. And then we've got to head down that green line to be 50% below 1990 levels by the year 2050. And the developed countries have to work at it very hard because we are a lot of the problem. And that shows, you, and the lists, uh, the things above that list, everything else. If we do nothing, we just follow up that red line. That's business as usual, according to the International Energy Agency. We will go right through the ceiling, and the world will become an impossible place. So that is the challenge to the world, to make that sort of program. The International Energy Agency was asked by the G8 countries in 2005 to say, please tell us what has to happen to the world's energy business in order to make two degrees. And they worked at it, they're very good people. I had quite a bit to do with some of them and it was a wonderful experience to work with them. And they, they published a volume, they published a Bible every year on World Energy Outlook, which is the outlook for 20 years, till 2030, for the whole of the world's energy industry, all the oil, all the coal, all the gas, where it's all going to come from, different countries, how they're all going to contribute and all, the, and all those things. And they, they worked out what had to be done in order to achieve that green line on the last diagram. And this is the sort of thing they wrote in their executive summary. We're at a crossroads. We can't carry on as we are, but we can change, and we need an energy revolution. They just published one a week ago, this year, and this is from their executive summary this year. The time has arrived, Copenhagen, decisive opportunity, we have to do something. And what's more, the recession in the world, because that's, people are not spending as much on energy, we've got the possibility of really beginning to change things in a big way. It's a wonderful opportunity. Is the world seeing it that way? They should do. They also, in those volumes, they tell us about the cost of doing it. People are very worried. They said, we can't afford it. Just read these numbers. If we carry on with business as usual in the energy business, we will spend $6 trillion a year on energy, infra energy things, <laughs> including all motor car all vehicles, anything to do with energy, the world will spend $6 trillion a year. That's what we spend if we carry on with business as usual. If we want to go down the green line and get two degrees, we will have to spend another trillion dollars a year <coughs> or 1% of the world's GDP. The 6 uh, trillion is 6% of the world's GDP. And that 1%, of course, is not so much compared with what we spend on lots of other things, like the Iraq war or, or bailing out the banks and so on. But read the next line. We will also, as we do that, we will save approximately $1 trillion a year in not buying fuel. So the net cost over that period will be around zero. And in fact, because we'll learn to be innovative and all sorts of things, we'll probably do it for much less. And the cost of doing it, and, and, the, and the IEA point out in their volumes, all the co-benefits of doing it, of having this revolution and setting it up, the problem it needs money up front, but there is money in the world and it can be done. We just need decisive, 
clear, determined action by the political world, by the industrial world, working together to make, him make it happen. And it really can be done. If you are sitting in Copenhagen, first day, first meeting, first diagram. This is per capita emissions, emissions per head of population. From the United States, you have about 25 tonnes for each American per year of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. For each European, it's about 10 tonnes. For each Chinese, it's about 5 tonnes. For each Indian or African, it's 1 or 2 tonnes. Copenhagen has to try to decide how to share this out amongst the nations of the world in a fair and genuine way. So how, how is he going to do that? That is the major political challenge they face. And that challenge brings with it a, an enormous moral alternative, a moral imperative. Because we in the West have grown rich over 200 years from coal and oil and gas. <coughs> that's the source of our wealth, all that energy that's come in to our industries. That's why we're so wealthy. We didn't realise the damage we were causing, and we didn't realise it was going to disproportionately hit the poor world much more than it's going to hit the rich world. So, the message to us is loud and clear. We have to reduce our emissions as fast as we can go, and we shouldn't make any bones about that at all. And we've got to also assist poor countries in developing sustainably. I'm coming to the end. Um, <clears throat> People often say to me, you know, you're wasting your time, Horton, because the policy institutions never agree. Don't carry on talking around the world about in this sort of way because you're utterly wasting your time. I say I'm optimistic and I give three reasons for being optimistic. And the first is I've worked with the world scientific community, which very remarkably has worked very responsibly and very carefully, very honestly together to come up with consensus answers. I know the necessary technology is available, we can do it. And then you say, well, why on earth bring God into it? I do that because for our fulfilment as human beings, we need not just money goals, material goals, we need moral and spiritual goals. And I just hope and pray that the effect of this enormous challenge of doing something about climate change, probably the biggest problem the world has ever faced, will be that the world begins to get together, the nations get together, to cooperate in ways like they've never cooperated before, because they have to, because if we don't, and not to compete in the crazy way we do at the moment. You know, here are we, the rich world, competing with the poor world. The flow of money in the world is from the poor to the rich. We've got, got it all wrong. The economics is, 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 really needs a revolution in order for us to learn to cooperate in a sensible way that will bring around a world which is worth living in. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for listening. And there is the Earth and the Moon. Much more fragile, I think, than we ever thought it was. Thank you.